Dr. Joey Antonio, welcome to the show. The American College of Sports Medicine had a very anti-resistance training point of view. Come on, guys, you guys studying muscle? Muscle's dumb. Yeah, people who lift weights, that's just bodybuilders and powerlifters. They don't know what the hell they're doing. All you need to do is aerobic exercise. We, we, don't, yeah. we don't agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I like muscle. I don't care about the... <laughs> Welcome to the Lee Labrada Show. Brought to you by Lean Body, the number one protein shake in gyms across America. Welcome back, you guys. Today, we're going to be talking with one of the country's foremost researchers in the field of exercise and sports science. We're going to be talking about sports neuroscience, sports nutrition, and even muscle soreness. Let's learn how you can benefit from this man's decades of wisdom. My guest earned his PhD and completed a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. He's the CEO and co-founder of the International Society of Sports sports nutrition, as well as the co-founder of the Society for Sports Neuroscience. He's a professor in exercise and sports science at Nova Southeastern University in Davie, Florida, and his research agenda includes work on high protein diets, sports neuroscience, sports supplements, and a lot more. He's also the author of over 15 books and over 120 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Joey Antonio, welcome to the show. Lee, it is an absolute pleasure and honor. I know uh, we've we've known each other for a long time, although our paths don't seem to cross physically. You know, I've thought about you many, many times, and I've followed your career and, I've, and your son as well. So it's kind of interesting how we met. A lot of people don't realize we met in Dallas, Texas, um, you know, about 30 years ago in at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. I was a PhD student. You were kind enough to just come in, and we just chatted about you know, training and hypertrophy and possibly, you know, the role of sports nutrition. I think at the time you were thinking about launching a brand. That's you know, right. LeBron. That's right. Yes. So, Great memory, Joey. <laughs> yeah. So it's crazy how we've gone from there. And, you know, I've been doing, I basically in the, the, the science industry now for three decades and you've been growing the Labrada nutrition brand for three decades. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's funny how things turn out and, um, when you meet high quality people, it, it's kind of fun to watch them grow over the course of time. Well, thanks for that, Joey. You know, we we met at the intersection of science and exercise. So this 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 is gonna be a really good one. Joey, you've had an amazing career as a researcher. And as you said, you know, we've known each other for over 25 years. You have a crazy number of published studies on so many subjects that are important to athletes. And you're a guy who's always on the cutting edge of sports science. So when you first mentioned the term sports neuroscience. I got to tell you, I, I hadn't heard that term before and it really caught my interest. And I want to share that with everybody today. So what is a general definition of sports neuroscience? Yeah, the, the way I tend to explain it is that we know what exercise science is because it's basically what I do, my colleagues do. You're in it as a practitioner. We're trying to marry exercise science with the study of neuroscience. And it seems like it seems like an odd match, but when you think about it, and a lot of us in the exercise field realize this, we just don't know how to study it. A lot of what we do is limited by our brain, by our ability to perceive, you know, to perceive the world. You know, whether it's um, training for bodybuilding or whether it's training for, you know, running the 100-mile uh, Western States run, a lot of the top-notch athletes say, hey, I'm limited by this, by my head. Right. But at the same time, we don't really know how to study it. So what, what's funny is about five years ago, I it sort of, it was uh, really happenstance. Uh, one of my colleagues, she's a neuroscientist, Jamie Tartar. Um, she had a student who said, hey, uh, you don't really know me, but I have a student who needs to use your lab because they need the treadmill. I'm like, why would he need the treadmill? Well, he wants to look at the effects of exercise on the way the brain perceives negative stimuli. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell that means, but <laughs> come to the lab. I'll even help them design the exercise part because the funny part is when you talk to neuroscientists, they really have no idea what exercise is. They can't define it. Yet to you and I, it's it's so easy because that's all we talk about. Right. So right. I remember meeting the student. He's like, yeah, I want him. We're going to compare running at a certain uh, uh, intensity to just doing nothing. And this is what's fascinating. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't know anything about neuroscience. So I was watching what he was doing. And after they would run or not run, they would show images on a screen that were either neutral, like a cup of coffee, or that were disturbing, like a dead dog or a corpse. And and wow. they measured brain activity. 
So I'm thinking, oh, this is kind of cool. I mean, I don't know much about the brain, but the net result is this is what we found. Prior exercise seems to blunt the response of the brain to negative stimuli, meaning it it doesn't affect you as much. Wow. Which, wow. What that means, I'm not sure, but I'm like, hey, that that's kind of cool. So what happened from that is she and I started to collaborate on these projects where we involved exercise and then measured something cognitively because the, here's the problem. Exercise scientists and neuroscientists typically never cross paths. We just, we just don't. But it just so happens we're at the same university. We had the same interests. And that's really how it started. So we actually had our our fourth annual conference this past February in the Society for Sports Neuroscience. So here's what's funny, Lee. It, it's it's an audience of exercise science people and on neuroscience side, people. On the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, here's the funny part. You can visually tell who the exercise science people are from neuroscience, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I, w- I, w- I would imagine so. Right. It, it's almost like getting a, a conference of bodybuilders and long distance runners. It's right, like, right. You kind of right. know who people are. <laughs> but um, well, the conversations are, are interesting because these are two groups that typically never talk to each other. And here we are talking to each other about, you know, they don't get the exercise part. We don't get the brain part, but we're trying to connect it. So it's really fascinating. It, it really is. You know, and, I, and as athletes, we've always known that there's a big connection between your performance and your ability to control your thoughts and your emotions and that type of thing. But it's uh, it's it's really cool. It's a, it, it seems to be uh, like a new frontier to be able to link the two and and to explore them, you know, quantitatively, you know. Um, so I, I, I saw those two studies that you sent over to me earlier, and one was about aerobic exercise, uh, you know, how it improve mental and emotional well-being and that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit to us about that and some of the neuroprotective effects and such? Yeah, this is one of those things where it's it's relatively, well, it's it's known to us in exercise that, hey, we exercise, we feel better. But we're really not sure why we feel better. And to be honest, nobody really knows why we feel better. But it seems to be there's this relationship between those who exercise, um, feeling it enhances cognition, we know that, and we know that people who don't exercise maybe tend to be more prone to depression and things like that. Exercise is probably the, the single best antidepressant you can, you can possibly get. Now, here's what's funny or ironic. This is what's ironic. Lee, you and I know that, and it's kind of sad, that 70% of our population is either overweight or obese. People who exercise, uh, okay, that's 70%. But then let's take the 30% who are, I'll call them normal weight. Even of the normal weight people, most don't exercise. So people who exercise, whether it's running, lifting, biking, swimming, we are such a rare breed that we forget that once we step outside of our circle, it's like, holy crap, most people actually don't move and they don't know what it, they don't know what it feels like to actually feel good. To them, maybe feeling tired is normal. And to you and I, feeling tired is like, wait a minute, why am I tired? Did I work out too much? Am I getting sick? We don't want to be tired. Um, so that can, that sort of brain-body connection, we're still trying to figure it out. And I'll tell you what, it is it is hard as hell to study. I mean, just think of, um, let's compare people who lift and people who run. My guess is you're probably not a regular distance runner, right? No, no, I, I run to the refrigerator to get my, to get my bodybuilding food. <laughs> you sound like most people I know. So they're like, I ain't running because I'm going to lose weight. So... But when you think about people who run, it's the only activity that causes what we would refer to as a runner's high. No one ever says, I have a swimmer's high. No one has a lifter's high. No one has a cycling high. Uh, but but, I, but I, have to, I have to tell you that when I am finished working out, I have a generally elevated mood. I feel yes. a, a lot better. Yes, and that's true for cycling, swimming, lifting. But there's something unique about running. And I, I talked to an evolutionary biologist about this. I said, why is it? just running that when they are running that's interesting they actually feel high and he said you know he goes to be honest i don't know and i don't know if anyone knows but his guess is because running is such a primal movement it's we're meant to run either we're running chasing prey or we're running away from predators right. that we learn to do this kind of movement and it's sort of ingrained in our dna and that's why we feel i guess pleasure from it whereas we're not really like Prehistoric man wasn't meant to just lift heavy weights because right. if you're lifting heavy weights, it means you're not chasing an animal for food. Right, you know? right. Yeah. 
So that's like, that's one of the questions people ask all the time. It's like, what is it about running? And people, you know, people feel like they get high off it, but not other exercise. And I don't run either. And, but I used to run when, when I was in college, I used to run and I'm like, wow, this really makes my brain feel, it's not just, I feel good. I feel really good. I, I wonder, um, I wonder if it's the, uh, the cadence, the repetitiveness, uh, you know, uh, almost like it just, it's hypnotic, you know? Yeah. In fact, a lot of runners will say that they get into this groove where all they hear is their footsteps. It's like, and that in, in and of itself has a sort of a hypnotic effect. Right. Um, right. But there's so many questions that we could ask in the sports neuroscience world. I mean, what I'm doing now is just asking some basic, basic questions as it relates to supplementation, how it affects reaction time, how, how it affects cognition and things like that. So in fact, we just did a, we just finished a study on an energy drink. I can't name the energy drink, but I will tell you this, that the dosing is too low. Whatever they put in the energy drink had no effect on sustained attention, had no effect on reaction time. So we're looking at things like that to see, you know, how all these things affect what happens at the central nervous system. Because at the end of the day, you know, I remember talking when I was in grad school, I remember talking the the, the next door neighbor, I called him, he was a neuroscientist. He said, come on guys, you guys studying muscle? muscle's dumb it's the brain that controls everything i'm like yeah yeah i like muscle i don't care about the brain he's like no 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 this controls your biceps no matter lot, how lot, you do lots it, to be said for that <laughs> yeah so so like when you work out hard you know at the end of the day it's your brain limiting you it's not it's not your muscle so we don't understand it that's what's crazy so Joey, let me ask you this. Uh, what are some of the other things that our viewers might be interested in, in terms of the link between the uh, uh, brain and exercise? You know, any, any, uh, anything come to mind? Well, right now we, we wrapped up a project on a very popular supplement. I'm sure you take it, creatine. And we gave it to, typically when you look at studies on creatine, uh, it's done on exercise trained people, particularly people who lift. Well, this study actually, we gave creatine to people who did nothing. Okay. It's kind of, it's kind of odd. I, I, I collaborated with a psychology professor. I'm like, I don't know anyone who takes creatine who doesn't exercise, but hey, let's, let's see what happens. So in this group of basically college, basically college students that did nothing, so they're sedentary, um, creatine actually helped them quite a bit in terms of measures of memory, um, you know, speed of processing and things like that. And I was really shocked by it because I always assume that you have to be exercising to get the benefits of creatine, but you literally could be a couch potato and still get the nervous system, the neural benefits of creatine. The problem is, and, and you could attest to this, a lot of people view creatine as a bodybuilding supplement True. versus one that's also, it can be good for cognition. So when you're talking to psychology students who don't know any better, they're like, well, why would I take this? I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm like, but, but you got a brain. That's right. You want to, you want your brain. To That's work. right. You have to, you, you have know, to, so it's, yeah, it's you have nutty. to have your brain working. You know, I had read uh, some things about that, uh, about, uh, the, uh, use of creatine for improving cognitive function and brain function, you know, and, um, intuitively, I think that it's got a place, you know, especially as we age, you know, I think that, um, uh, you know, we, we probably don't get enough of that in our diet, you know, and I think that there may be some, some, uh, real benefits, which leads me to, uh, you know, to thinking about nootropics, you know, so nootropics being, you know, I guess smart drugs or smart supplements, class of substances that uh, can boost brain performance. So um, what, what, what is your take on that? And um, uh, what are some of your favorites? You know, when you look at the nootropic category, um, compared to the typical stuff where we look at the effects of supplements on exercise, there's not that much stuff out there compared to just looking at the effects of exercise. Uh, I mean, typically the the major ones obviously are caffeine, creatine. Those are the big ones, maybe the omega-3 fatty acids. And then you have others like um, uh, theocrine, dynamine. These are substances that uh, we actually published a study on this where we combine theocrine, dynamine, and caffeine versus the equivalent amount of caffeine, showing it helps, for instance, with... Um, e-gamer performance. I'm not a video game guy. I don't know if you are, but right. apparently there's a bazillion it's, people it's, who play video games. It's a huge games. industry. Huge industry, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, wow, Pete, there's, who are all these people that play right. these games? Apparently they're all over the place except me. I'm like, I've never played these games. But we found that in this group of e-gamers, it actually helped their performance playing video games when they combined 
caffeine helps, but when it's combined with tetracycline and dynamine, it seems to help even more. So that would be an example of you know some neurotropics that, that could help. And then of course, um, theanine. You add theanine to caffeine, it might smooth it out a little. Um, but I think this this area is so ripe for research because people, it's almost like people are guessing. I've, I've looked at some of the products online just to see what they put in it, and it seems like everyone's sort of copying everyone else because no one's really sure what the proper dosing should be, um, the frequency of taking it, you know, whether uh, it works just acutely or you have to you take it chronically. It's it's a big black box right now. And, it, you know, for people who like to do research, it's like wide open. It reminds me almost of the early days of sports nutrition where everybody copied each other's formula, you know, and, and they would uh, maybe uh, look up a few studies online, you know, for the reason for this ingredient being in there or that ingredient being in there. But really uh, no hard research, you know, in terms of cause and correlation, you know, between, uh, you know, a uh, uh, supplement and the uh, actual you know performance you know so spe speaking of supplements you know you guys just had your uh 21st annual issn conference international society of sports nutrition of which you're a co-founder let's talk about that for a moment and uh what were some of the most interesting developments that you're seeing in sports nutrition yeah this is a. Uh, it's funny this is it was our 20th year and um as you well know sports nutrition and sports supplements really had a I don't want to say bad reputation. It, it had a weird reputation for people outside of the industry. Like to you and I, it's like supplements are great. Some work, some don't. But outside of us, particularly in the medical profession, the allied health profession, they had a really negative view of it. And I'm talking about- Still. I remember going to the American College of Sports Medicine meetings. This is in the 80s and 90s. And they were very anti-supplement. Not because there was all this data. It was just because sort of, sort of uh, it was- I guess part of the zeitgeist of the time, it was just the way they viewed it. It's like, oh, supplements. Well, supplements, that's what bodybuilders take. So of course it's bullshit because bodybuilders take it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you have to listen to what athletes do because oftentimes they sort of figure it out through trial and error. You no can't just say, oh, it doesn't work because it's bodybuilding. Um, so myself and a lot of my colleagues who have, we had an athletic background, we like to train. We thought, okay, they're getting this wrong. All these clinicians are getting it wrong. And that really was the impetus for starting the International Society of Sports Nutrition. So going back from 2004 to now, you know, we've had 20, conf uh, 20 conferences and the sports nutrition category has grown like crazy. Let me just give you an example. For instance, before the year 2000, you, it would be almost impossible to find a college course in sports nutrition. It was so rare. Why? Because most faculty in biology or nutrition thought it was just a waste of time. Now... The year 2023, every college has a sports nutrition course. I mean, it literally went in two decades from nothing to like, oh yeah, we need our sports nutrition course because now it's the cool, sexy thing. Everyone loves sports nutrition. Right. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, right. I was getting holy shit for this like 30 years ago. Right. You know, so, you know, in a way we've won. It's like, you know, we lost the battle, but we won the war. It's like, yeah, we won, but. They'll never admit they were wrong back then. So right. it's like, okay, whatever. You, you know, it almost reminds me of uh, uh, once upon a time, you know, early, early in the infancy of, of uh, exercise science and physiology, uh, you know, there there were coaches that told their baseball players uh, and, and, and some of the other uh, sports players, don't lift weights because it'll make you muscle bound. And now you go into any high school or college curriculum and all all athletes use resistance training in one way or another. Yeah, it, you know what? That's a great point. And, and what's interesting, Lee, is we we lived through it. A lot of my college students, they're like, wow, people actually thought that? To them, it's like, right. well, of course you lift weights. It's good for you. But to you and I, I remember, put it this way, in the 1970s and 80s, the American College of Sports Medicine had a very anti-resistance training um, point of view. It's it was like, unbelievable. Oh, yeah, people who lift weights, that's just bodybuilders and powerlifters. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They're just trying to get big and strong. And you don't need to be big and strong because all you need to do, remember, this is 1980. All you need to do is aerobic exercise. Cardio. Right, right. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then later in the 80s, a, an organization called the National Strength and Conditioning Association, founded by basically by guys who lifted weights. They're like, you know what? We think lifting weights is good for you. Um, so they founded the NSCA and they promoted the idea that heavy resistance training is good for everybody, good for athletes, good for kids, no good doubt. for, you know, good for, uh, not just performance, but, but for general health and get this Lee, you'll, you'll get a kick out of this. I remember 
going to a conference. This is the American College of Sports Medicine. And I remember the guy giving a presentation. He, he had this thing that he hated people who lift weights or whatever. <laughs> he put a picture of a bodybuilder up on the screen. And he said this. And I remember it because I was like, holy shit, he actually said that. <laughs> he said, get this. He said, no one's ever died of having weak muscles. I was like, wow. He's... Like, yeah, we yeah, have, we have, yeah. Well, no, we don't. We, we don't. We don't agree with that. Yeah. What about sarcopenia? You know, muscle loss as you as you get older. Yeah. So when you gotta remember it in the 1980s, this was commonly thought, and that's what's so strange. And and literally, our lifetime in a short amount of time, it went from this is a waste of time to wow, I think everyone needs to do it. Even even people who have never lifted and are 70 years old, start lifting. It might help you or do something, any kind of resistance training. Do something One, because 100%. in the long run, it'll help. 100%. So, Joey, we talked about how much um, uh, sports nutrition has grown in in the last 20 years. Now, where do you see it heading? Do you think that there's going to be um, a more acceptance from the medical community? Do you see uh, new supplements that are being uh, developed besides the traditional protein and creatine and those basic things? I think uh, in, in answer to the latter one, I think that just takes a little bit longer because as new ingredients come out, it takes a while to get research on them. And um, so that might be a little slower. Now, on the medical front or people in the clinical sciences, here's what's interesting. If you talk to a majority of them, they're still fairly anti, I guess, anti-supplement or most supplements you don't need. And I'm, I'm including creatine. I mean, you don't need it. Um, however, there is a small contingent of physicians who, who are well-versed, I guess, in the science and they're trying to promote it. I mean, some of my students, I remember I have students going back, you know, 15 years who are now medical doctors. And, you know, I had one say to me, you know, if it wasn't for your class, I think I'd be thinking that supplements were a waste of time. But after listening to you and looking at the science, you know, he's, he's trying to teach his colleagues that, you know, but there is something to sports nutrition. And, and the idea that modern medicine can do things that you and I do, it, it just doesn't work. You and I know the best thing you can do for someone's health is exercise. And medical doctors just aren't taught that. So in, in essence, anything related to exercise, they're kind of like, eh, well, you know, we got drugs, we got medicine. You know, and yeah, and that's why 70% of the country is overweight and, and obese. You know, they're diabetic, they're this, they're that. If you don't get them exercising and maybe using the proper supplements, I think, God, God forbid, imagine if this country ends up being 80 or 90 percent overweight or obese. Yeah, that would be insane. It, it would be. And, and unfortunately, it seems to be uh, heading in, uh, in in that direction. You know, it just uh, it, it seems like people just can't get it in their heads that exercise is something that the body needs on a day to day basis. You know, I get asked a lot, you know, it's like, man, you know, how do you stay in such great shape? I mean, what what do you do? And I go, it's very simple. Every day I move. Okay, so whether whether it's lifting weights or whether it's, uh, you know, it's doing the stair stepper, you know, or whether it's swimming or whether it's bicycling, but every day I move, you have to move your blood, you know, and then secondly, and I'm, I'm telling you something, I mean, it's just so basic to you and I, secondly, you have to nourish your body, you know, so to me, it just blows my mind that the medical community still gives nutrition a backseat to medicine, you know, and I think that uh, I think that it speaks volumes about the way that we approach medicine in this country, you know, which is, you know, more of, uh, you know, curative or putting a bandaid on things versus preventative. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and, and I think the, I'll call them the public health experts. They lost a gigantic opportunity from the years 2020 to 2022. We know the data show that people who had poor outcomes from COVID had comorbidities, they were diabetic, they were overweight, they were hypertensive. And I was thinking, this is the best time to tell people to exercise. This is the best time to tell people to watch what they eat. But they're closing down the gyms. <laughs> they were closing down the gyms. Yes, that uh, that drove me insane. It's like, what? The, not just the gyms. I remember seeing pictures of playgrounds with police tape around them because they didn't want kids playing on the playground. I'm right. Thinking, this is crazy, but the, here's the thing. I've lost all respect for the so-called public health experts because they literally did not ever talk about public health. 
<laughs> the whole time. They didn't talk about public health. And right, thinking, right. This is crazy. I can't believe this is happening. Can't yeah, it's, it. it's, it's amazing. But anyway, I think that uh, people are becoming more and more enlightened. You know, for those of you that are watching, you know, again, just get exercise every day, you know, watch what you eat, you know, and, and get well versed in what your body needs in terms of basic nutrients. It's it's not difficult, guys, you know, but it really pays off in terms of the quality of your life and your longevity. You know, let's talk a second about something uh, that, um, you know, that's really important to those of us that are exercising muscle recovery. Joey, I know that you've been doing some research on muscle soreness lately. Is there anything that you can share with us about that? Yeah, there's a couple of things. One, it, it you almost have to divide it into the different athletic populations. When I talk to bodybuilders, they don't seem to mind being sore. Um, whether or not you need it for hypertrophy is questionable, but they don't mind being sore because it shows they did X amount of work. Um, maybe they did negatives the day before or two days before. But well, to them, it's not an issue. When you talk to people in performance sports, whether they play baseball or anything that requires skill, baseball, volleyball, being sore actually doesn't carry any benefit. In fact, it might inhibit your ability to not use the word train, but to do skill stuff. So when you're working on the skill of hitting a ball, you don't want to be sore. So the, the way to get through that is one, there are obvious modalities that might help, whether it's massage. Some people think, uh, cold water immersion helps in terms of lessening soreness, but there's also some supplements you could take. We know dietary protein help. We know creatine helps. We know the branch chain amino acids help. Um, I was just actually, just before the show, I was doing some reading on astaxanthin. It looks like that might have some effect on decreasing muscle soreness. So um, just, just by decreasing the amount of muscle soreness, it'll allow you to train in whatever skill sport you have. Whereas... In bodybuilding, it, I don't think it's much of an issue because in a sense, most of the bodybuilders I've met don't really mind being sore. It shows where they've trained, you know, what parts of their body they've trained. But um, but there is a growing body of evidence. Like when you look at the supplement category, I often have told people, what do people want? Gain muscle, lose fat, feel better. So the feel better part, you know, carries a wide variety of things. But Gain muscle, lose fat, feel better. Does that fourth thing that people are thinking about now, especially people my age, your age, whatever, recovery. And I'll tell you this, 30 years ago when we met, I, you know, whenever I trained, I could recover. Right. Now, when I train, I could train just as hard. It just takes me a hell of a lot longer to recover. So I'm thinking, damn, I need to do something. I need to get more massages or something or take more protein. I don't know. It's something. Right, so, right. In a, in a way, my interest in recovery is sort of, mirrored my age because I'm I'm thinking I need to do something for me. I need to recover better because and I know we all know age we know age impacts your ability to recover. 100% and re recovery really is where it's at. You know, now some of the things that I, that I do uh, for recovery, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I do supplement with uh, protein. I do supplement with things like glutamine, uh, vitamin C, you know, I'm a big believer in the use of, of, of vitamin C. You know, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, using, uh, you know, th thermal gradients, let's say, you know, meaning uh, alt alternating cold and warmth to, you know, create a thermal pump in and out, you know, you know, get blood in and out of a, of a sore muscle, that kind of a thing. But yeah, I have noticed that, uh, you know, as, as we get older, it does take more time to, uh, uh, recover, you know, and so that's, uh, you know, that, that's an important thing. Joey, let me ask you this. What are some of the supplements that you take? You know, a lot about supplements because of, of your association and your research, you know, so what do you take personally? You know, it's a great question. Uh, I've, I've become so automatic in what I take that I actually had to have to think about what it is. I have to look at the pills and powders. I take I take, I take creatine every day. And here's the Me funny thing. I take three to five grams of creatine since like 1990 something. I mean, it's been that long. Um, and I prefer capsules over powder because I feel like it's just easier to figure out how much I'm getting with a capsule. Um, I take as I've actually been taking aspirin, a baby aspirin every day for like the last 30 years. So what, I take like baby a, a, 81 milligram aspirin or yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I take, uh, uh, for my joints, I take glucosamine. Um, I also take ubiquinol for the heart. I mean, general heart health. I know exercise is number one, but I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it'll help. Maybe it won't. You know, my feeling is if it helps or has a neutral effect, it's still worth taking. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah. And then I, I take a lot. I mean, I always do protein post-workout. That's a big, big part of it. Um, I also take, um, <laughs> because I can't, my eyesight's never been great. So I take, uh, lutein and zeaxanthin for, right. for the, for the eyes. I take those as well. Um, yep. Yeah. And, and so th- those are my basic ones that I take. Um, I'll buy random supplements here and there and I'll take them and just to see what happens. But uh, those are the basic ones. I think for me, the most important ones are, are creatine and protein. Now, I, would agree. I don't, yeah, I don't typically think of caffeine as a supplement, although I, I, I like drink a bucket full of coffee in the morning and then I go train. So, but I guess if you want to call it caffeine a supplement, but those are my basics that I take. I, I would say that those are my basics as well. Now, uh, Joey, I, I know that uh, you share a lot of this type of information, the uh, things on the research that you do. Uh, you have uh, other guests on this show that you have on YouTube, which I checked out and it's really, really good, called the Sports Science Dudes. Tell us about the Sports Science Dudes. Yeah, we, uh, you know, I had been asked to launch a podcast actually many times and I just didn't have the time. And and I decided this year that, you know what, I'm in a stage in my career where I think it'd be a good idea to launch a podcast dedicated just to sports science. So I'm the host. My co-host is Tony Ricci. His background is he trains primarily fighters. Um, he's faculty at the same university. He's an exercise science faculty, but his bread and butter is he trains fighters, MMA guys, wrestlers, boxers, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some great athletes. So, yeah. So we have a lot of guys. We try to get um, mostly science people uh, to talk about the research, maybe a few practitioners here and there. And the goal is this. It's to promote. We're trying to bridge the gap between the average consumer and what, you know, science people. It's sort of like lawyers talk to each other. Science people talk to each other. But we need to talk to other people. You right. Know? So our goal is to get that get that message out to other people because they're the ones who need to know this. No so, doubt. Um, yeah, we cover I we cover every I mean we cover supplements, all the supplements you could probably think of. And if there's any that we're missing, Lee, hey, feel free to send me a text and say, "Hey, you should get this guy on and talk <laughs> about this supplement because, you know, we'll we'll talk to anybody." That's but, um, that's great. But yeah, but the goal is and you know this, there's so much crap out there and and here's the battle I'm fighting. I don't know if this is the battle you fight is I learn about the crap out there mainly from students. They're like, hey, have you seen this thing on Instagram about blah, blah, blah? I'm like, oh, God. Social media is such a great invention because we can get information out there. The problem is everybody gets information out there. And and you have to be able to cut through the misinformation. That's for sure. Yeah. I feel like it's the movie 300 where I'm part of the 300 and there's a million Persians coming through and I'm like, you know, I we'll hold off the first half million, but after that, we're done. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, really amazing. So it's it's great when you have a uh, a go to source uh, like yourself uh, and the science dude. So I would encourage everybody to check that out, Doctor Joey Antonio. Great job today, my friend. It's been very educational, and I, I want to really thank you for for joining me. But before you go, uh, Joey, where can viewers find out more information about your research? Where can they follow you, and how do they find your podcast, The Sports Science Dudes. Okay, the podcast, it's on YouTube, Rumble, Spotify. Just type in Sports Science Dudes, you'll it'll it'll pull right up. So if you want good general information you, and you don't want to read all the science jargon, that's the, that's the place to go. In terms of finding me, I would say the best place would be go to ISSN.net. That's ISSN.net. It goes to our conference, we, the, uh, the website that shows all the conferences. I'm, I'm, I'm at all these conferences. And I always think networking face-to-face is still number one. No matter how much you meet people on social media, you're not really meeting them. You think you're meeting them, but you're not meeting them. (laughs) You got to meet them face-to-face. So I implore people to come to the ISSN conference. It's always in Florida. People love Florida, the beach. Every June, the conference, our national conference is there. So you can reach me there. You can reach me on Twitter. It's uh, uh, Jose Antonio PhD. That's on Twitter. It's Jose Antonio PhD. And also you can find me on Instagram under the underscore ISSN. That's the underscore ISSN. And we try to promote science. I'm trying to get the best information out there. And, you know, I hope we 
you know, I hope we do a good job. You do a great job, Joey, and you do a great job of taking what a lot of times are difficult topics and making them understandable uh, for people. So I want to thank you on behalf of our our uh, exercise community. Uh, you know, the, uh, you guys are doing a great job. Hey, guys, help us. Have, to, what's that? I have one more thing to say yes, I, yes. I, before we before we go. I, I want uh, my, my wife said, make sure you tell Lee that I love the Labrata shake. It's, 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 it's R, RTD. It, and we got, here's the thing. I don't know if you're like this. We have a refrigerator out in the garage. It has two things, RTDs and beer. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully you're not drinking them both at the same time. <laughs> RTDs in the morning, beer in the evening. There you go. There you go. Joey, thank you so much, my friend. This has just been, this has been very educational and entertaining. Hey guys, help us to grow the Lee Labrada show by sharing this podcast with one of your friends and be sure to hit the subscribe button. So, all right, you guys stay motivated, get up, look up. God bless you.